out there every day doing a great job for us. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. President, uh, I would uh, yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. I thank the Chair. Mr. President, I want to thank uh, the Senator from Vermont uh, for his uh, statement, but really more broadly for, the, for the, the, his real steadfastness and the hard work that he's done uh, to, uh, to improve the bill. Uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him. Before Senator Collins uh, came to the floor, and not counting the occupant of the chair, I was uh, re really reveling in the fact that the only senators on the floor were independents. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, I thank Senator uh, Sanders. Um, we've tried to deal with this problem. You know, the, in the postal reform of 2006, Senator Sanders is quite right. Uh, for various reasons, uh, which we need not go into, um, the Postal Service was required to make payments into the Retiree Health Benefit Fund uh, that were beyond what most any business or uh, other governmental ent entity is doing, M more than was necessary to sustain the payments. Uh, and and in, a, in a much shorter period of time, as Senator from Vermont said, and uh, I, I'd say, just to state it as, as bluntly as I can, maybe too bluntly, uh, the people advocating this were frankly concerned that the post office might, postal service might get to a point where it defaulted. It, it was no longer able to operate, and then the fear was that uh, the government, the, the U.S. Treasury, the taxpayers would at some point in the future be forced to pick up the cost of the retiree health benefits. And so um, this um, uniquely demanding responsibility for payment now was put on the Postal Service. Well, I think everybody agrees, particularly in light of all the uh, real problems that the Postal Service has now that uh, that's just not sensible or fair. So I do want to point out that in the uh, underlying bill, S. 1789, we've attempted to ease the Postal Service's pre-funding requirements for retiree health benefits by immediately beginning a stretched out 40-year amortized schedule for these payments. And we require the Office of Personnel Management when determining how much the Postal Service has to put in to the Retiree Health Benefit Fund every year to use the same discount rate that's used to calculate the federal government's pension obligations to the federal employee's retirement system and the civil service uh, retirement system. And uh, the Postal Service uh, thinks that th this accounting change uh, will reduce their uh, unfunded liability for the retiree health benefits uh, plan by uh, literally uh, billions of dollars. The other change made here is that um, right now the, the health benefits of, of retired employees come out of the operating expenses of the Postal Service, uh, and that was going to be the case until a date later in this decade. Uh, but there's enough money in the fund that it can pick up money that the Postal Service has put in, that it can pick up the uh, cost of, of health benefits for postal retirees now, and so we require that. So I just want to state for the record that uh, we're, we're trying to deal with that uh, reality in the, in the bill as it is, and of course state my intention to continue to work with Senator Sanders to make uh, this bill as good as we can and, and uh, both in, in accomplishing all the purposes we have, which is to keep the Postal Service alive and well uh, because so many people uh, depend on it and to do so in a uh, much more fiscally responsible way in, in every way in which that term might be understood including the fairness of payments into the retiree health benefits uh, plan then has been the case before. Uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maine. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I too want to comment on this issue of the pre-funding for the health care benefits of future retirees. I think it's important to note that when the 2006 law was written, that the Postal Service supported this provision because it recognized that it had a huge unfunded liability for future health benefits. And it knew that it was important to start putting money aside to ensure that it, at the time that those retirees needed to claim those benefits, the money would be there and the promises would be kept. It was also important because we wanted to avoid the possibility of a system going into default and taxpayers having to step in to keep the promises that the Postal Service has made. The fact is that the current liability is about $46 billion for those, uh, those retirees' uh, health benefits, the future retiree health benefits. And that liability is a very real one. It is not going away. But nevertheless, we have taken steps in our bill, as Senator Lieberman has just described, to ease the funding by setting up a 40-year amortization schedule and by changing the discount rate. So those two provisions should save the Postal Service between, well, approximately $2 billion, the exact number would be determined uh, each year, and that's obviously very welcome. But I do want to address what I believe is another misconception, and that is that the funding for future retirees' health benefits is somehow the cause of the Postal Service's financial crisis. It is not. The fact is that the Postal Service has not made its payment of $5.5 billion that was due to this fund in either of the last two fiscal years. And yet the Postal Service lost billions in both of those years despite not paying the $5.5 billion that was due to this fund. In total, the Postal Service has made only $6.9 billion of the $16.4 billion that was required in pre-funding payments for the past three years, but has posted losses, total losses, for those three years of $26.9 billion. So it's certainly true that we can and should ease the funding requirement in light of the, um, the problems of the Postal Service. It's also true that we don't need to fund to 100 percent, which the 2006 law requires. And we have indeed lowered the funding level to, I believe, 80 percent, if memory serves me correctly. And those provisions all have a, a substantial impact on lowering the annual payment. But just two final points that I want to reiterate. The pre-funding requirement is not the cause of the Postal Service's financial crisis. And second, that $46 billion liability is very real. It's not going away. And indeed, stretching out the amortization schedule, which I believe we should do, is going to actually cause that liability to increase because we'll be paying it off over a longer period of time. Nevertheless, I think the changes that we've made in the funding for future retirees' health benefits make sense. 
I think they're financially responsible and they will provide some needed relief to the Postal Service without exposing taxpayers to the possibility of having to pick up the tab and without breaking the promise that has been made to postal employees. Thank you, Mr. President. Then I would suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
Uh, Mr. President, Senator from Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the uh, quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. And I ask unanimous consent to uh, speak for up to 10 minutes as if in morning business. Without objection. Th thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I come to the uh, floor today, and this being uh, tax week, people all around the country send in their uh, tax returns. The deadline has just passed uh, yesterday, the 17th. So people are focused a lot on what happens in Washington. They think about the IRS. They think about the money that is being sent and how that money is being spent. Well, as people pay their annual tax bills, I want to remind Americans about how this administration, the Obama administration, is spending tax dollars on actually the president's unpopular health care law. And that's why I come to the floor today as I have every week uh, since the health care law has been passed with a doctor's second opinion about the, the health care law. And at the time it was passed, I said, you know, there'd be some new revelation, some unintended consequence, something new that people would learn week after week. Uh, and as someone who's practiced medicine for uh, almost a quarter of a century, taking care of families in Wyoming, um, I wanted to offer a doctor's second opinion because I've felt from the beginning that uh, in spite of the many promises that the president made, that the bill that was actually passed and signed into law is one that is bad for patients, uh, bad for providers, the nurses and the doctors who take care of those patients, and uh, terrible for taxpayers. And so uh, I come to the floor because it, it seems to me that instead of using much of the money to improve medical care in America, this administration is devoting hundreds of millions of dollars to whom? The Internal Revenue Service. In fact, uh, the, the Hill newspaper uh, reported on April 9th of this year uh, that the Obama administration is quietly sending an additional $500 million to the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. The, uh, actually, the headline is, Obama administration diverts $500 million to IRS to implement health care reform law. And I ask unanimous consent, uh, Mr. President, that I could introduce this uh, article into the record. Without objection. Th thank you, Mr. President. Um, the, the money is transferred outside of the normal appropriations process. And that's a concern. The money is transferred outside the normal appropriations process. And it goes to the very tax agency that is responsible to implement many of the key provisions of the health law. You would think that maybe you'd have doctors and nurses implementing many of the provisions of the health law. No, we have the IRS. Uh, this includes the, the controversial and unprecedented mandate that all Americans must buy a government-approved product, health insurance. Well, remember that the Supreme Court just held hearings uh, and uh, on this uh, unprecedented mandate. 70% of Americans believe that it is unconstitutional. They believe that uh, either part or all of the health care law ought to be ruled unconstitutional. And yet the Hill article goes on and it says that this Obama Health and Human Services Department has to date transferred almost $200 million to the IRS over the past two years and plans to send another $300 million this year. These secretive transfers hide the true cost of the health care law. They also make it difficult for Congress to perform the agency oversight that is part of our obligations. So I look at this, Mr. President, and I say, this, this law is, it is bad. It is bad, I believe, for our patients and providers and taxpayers. And I look at the way it's been structured and the way that this money is being transferred, and I think it just highlights the problems with the law. What does the IRS intend to do? Well, they want to hire more than 300 new employees next year to implement the tax code changes, such as the taxes imposed on drug companies, device manufacturers, and health insurers. This bill is a laundry list of taxes and fees. The IRS also has to implement and monitor the law's uh, priciest component, the exchange subsidies. For this, the IRS is asking Congress to fund another 537 new employees dedicated to administering just the subsidies. Now, last week, Mr. President, uh, the Ways and Means Chairman, uh, Chairman Camp, sent a letter to the IRS Commissioner asking that, uh, that the, that the uh, Commissioner provide specific details about these reports. Chairman Camp specifically asked the IRS Commissioner to tell the committee how many employees are being hired 
and which tax increases the agents will be working on. You know, the American people deserve to know how their dollars are being spent, where these tax dollars are being used, what the IRS is doing with the money. They deserve to know because the health care law actually increases the IRS's power to insert itself into the American people's lives. Say, so how is it that the health care law increases the IRS's power to insert itself into Americans' lives? Well, by one, verifying, having the IRS verify that Americans have acceptable government-approved insurance. Also, by having the IRS penalize Americans if they do not have acceptable government-approved insurance. Also, by having the IRS confiscate Americans' tax refund dollars if they don't have government-approved insurance. And finally, by having the IRS having additional power in terms of auditing our American citizens' lives. Mr. President, this is all included in the health care law. This is not health care reform. The IRS should never be allowed to intrude into the private health care decisions of the American people. The American people deserve to know how this alleged $500 million transfer is being spent and how many additional IRS agents will be hired to investigate their private health care decisions. When Americans send their hard-earned dollars to Washington, they want to make sure that their money is being spent wisely, that the American people want to know that they are getting value for their tax dollars. They don't want their dollars to create more bureaucracy and further invade their privacy. And so, Mr. President, I come to the floor today, as I have over the last several years since the health care law has been passed, with a doctor's second opinion. This health care law did not provide the American people with what they wanted, which was the care they need from a doctor that they want at a price they can afford. Instead, what they're doing is seeing that the President's promises have been broken. The President promised if you like your care, you can keep it. We now know that that's not going to be true for many, many Americans. And the President promised that health care costs would actually go down instead of going up. And he told Congress and he told others that uh, that the health care insurance costs would drop $2,500 per family. Instead, what families across the country have seen is their health care premiums have gone up by about $2,100 a year since the health care law uh, has gone into effect, rather than going down. So we hear the President's promises, and we see the reality on the ground. And so when I travel Wyoming and talk to folks and say, how many of you believe under the health care law that uh, your own costs your own costs are going to go up, in spite of the President's promise that they would go down, every hand goes up. And when I ask the question, how many of you believe that the quality of your own care, which is what people concern, are concerned about, their own care, their own family, how many of you believe that the quality of your own care will go down? Again, every hand goes up. That's not what Americans want, paying more and getting less. And that is why it is time, Mr. President, to repeal and replace this terrible health care law. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Hickok.
senator from Montana is recognized. I ask that the quorum call be eviscerated. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise today to discuss this uh, postal reform bill. The Postal Service keeps rural America connected. It helps Montana seniors receive everyday necessities like medicines. It allows our small businesses to conduct business. And it even makes sure that our election ballots uh, get counted on time. And that is why this reform bill is so critically important all across rural America. First, I want to thank my colleagues on the committee for their hard work on the substitute amendment to the postal reform bill. I want them to know how much that I appreciate their efforts to work across the aisle and with my colleagues and me to address several of our concerns with this bill. This bill has come a long way from the version that I opposed in committee, but there is still a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that it works for rural America. I've been working for several months on some changes, such as preserving the requirement for overnight delivery and providing better protection for rural communities that could lose their post offices. But we need to go further to find more ways to keep rural post offices open and functioning. That's why Senator Franken and Senator Levin and I have introduced an amendment to prevent the Postal Service from closing a post office if it leaves rural communities without sufficient access to postal services, like buying stamps uh, to regular mail service. Our amendment gives the Postal Regulatory Commission more teeth in being able to reject the Postal Service's effort to close post offices and mail processing facilities if the Postal Service does not follow the criteria laid out in the bill. Mr. President, the Postmaster General is seeking to close uh, around 3,700 post offices and over 200 mail processing facilities in this country. This bill will result in the reduction of another 100,000 postal employees. It will rewrite the rules of workers' compensation across the entire federal government. In short, it will change the lives of many, many people, to say nothing of the millions of Americans who will be impacted by a change in mail service. So with this in mind, I think it's critically important that the upper management of the Postal Service and the Board of Governors lead by example. That's why I'm offering an amendment to reduce the number of governors on the Postal Board of Governors from nine to seven. The board is currently not at capacity, and it should be encouraged to work with the six governors who presently sit on the board. Governors receive compensation for expenses and a stipend of about 30,000 bucks a year, with a total compensation up to about 42,600. It seems like a small savings. However, reducing up to 80,000 a year by cutting two positions could save three post offices in my state. For example, a Depuri or a Wyola or a Coffee Creek. We need to make sure everyone is tightening their belts, not, that just, not just the folks who depend on mail service, or the employees who will be forced into retirement or laid off over the next few years. My final amendment limits the six most senior postal executives, including the Postmaster General. Uh, and that limit is to a base salary of not more than $200,000, which is what a cabinet secretary makes. Now, I know there are some folks that think the Postal Service should be a private enterprise and that the pay of the postal executives should reflect that. But in, the reality is, the Postal Service is public service. It's right there in the Constitution that the Congress has the power to establish post offices. You can't get much more public than that. And again, the savings from this amendment may seem like a drop in the bucket, but saving just $200,000 a year in reduced executive compensation is the same savings you would get from the closure of a mail processing center in Helena, Montana State Capitol, and have it an important town in north central Montana. To me, the choice is simple. If the Postal Service is out of money and painful cuts have to be made, they need to be felt up at the top as much as at the bottom. I hope that we get a chance to consider these amendments. They are relevant to the bill. This is a debate that is long overdue. It's time to have a serious debate in the Senate about what we want the Postal Service to look like. And that is why I voted to begin the debate on a bill that I cannot support yet. 
I want to get to the point where we have a bill that's going to save the Postal Service and not lead to its dismantling. So let's have the debate. Let's look at the amendments and let's start voting. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor and uh, uh, seek the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Agago.
In the Senate today, most of the work has centered on a violence against women bill and reform of the Postal Service. No votes expected in the Senate today. And, of course, our continued live coverage right here on C-SPAN 2. Over in the House, members have been working on another 90-day extension of the highway bill. They are voting right now on a procedural motion related to that legislation. You can see that taking place right now on C-SPAN. C-SPAN 3 shortly will have live coverage of a briefing with Senator Jeff Sessions on the budget process. This will be ahead of the Senate Budget Committee's markup of the Democrats' budget proposal this afternoon. Live coverage of that briefing with Senator Sessions will get underway at 145 Eastern, again on C-SPAN 3. And then the uh, Budget Committee's markup at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern, an alternative to the one offered by House Budget Committee Chair. That will get underway at 2 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3. President Obama is on the road today discussing the economy. He's attending events, uh, campaign events this afternoon. He'll be speaking at Lorain County Community College in Elyria, Ohio. That'll be at about 2 p.m. Eastern. You'll be able to see that on cspan.org. And then at 5.50 Eastern, he'll be hosting a political fundraiser at the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan.
I ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, thank you. This week marks